Hello and welcome to the first of two research methods videos covering kinds of data. In this video we're going to have a look at qualitative and quantitative data. We're going to go over what they both are and then look at some strengths and limitations before finishing off with some exam questions. In the second video, which is linked below in the description section, we're going to cover primary and secondary data. So when we talk about data, what we're actually talking about is the information that is gathered for a particular study. And as you can imagine, and as I'm sure you're already aware, there are lots of different types of data and there are lots of different ways in which you can collect those types of data. So what we're going to look at today is quantitative and qualitative data, what it is, strengths and weaknesses of it, how it's collected and so on primary versus secondary data, and then again, the evaluation points for them and a little bit on how it's collected. And then we are going to finish off with a specific type of secondary data called meta-analyses. So qualitative and quantitative data. Quantitative data is essentially numbers. Okay, so it is data that can be expressed numerically um, and that can be statistically analyzed and easily converted into graphs or can easily be used to create means or standard deviations or something along those lines. You can get quantitative data from doing experiments. So for example, in a memory experiment and seeing how many words an individual can remember. Okay, so it's easy to count up how many words they remembered and it is quantitative data. Okay, you could also do things like structured observations, you could do correlations, you could use questionnaires with closed questions, you know, it's that kind of thing. Whereas qualitative data, on the other hand, is non-numerical data, it is language-based data or descriptive data. Okay, so it's collected through semi-structured interviews or unstructured interviews um, or open questions in questionnaires. Okay, so it's the type of data that allows a participant to expand on what it is that they want to say. And it also gives the researcher um, a nice insight into the experiences of their participants because the participants are allowed to develop their opinions and feelings and so on. Okay, so it's not a clear cut yes or no answer. It's not numerical in that sense. It is descriptive and word based data. Okay, um, you can, like I said, you can get these from things like semi structured interviews, unstructured interviews, and open questions. Okay, so just an example uh, for both of them. So you have Milgram is an example of quantitative data. Okay, so they were working their way up the shock generator and Milgram was very easily able to count up how many people went all the way up to 450 volts, how many people dropped out at 300 volts um, and so on and so on. Okay, so his data was very easily converted into a numerical format and he could then do things like work out percentages, averages and so on. However, if you're going to ask a recovering schizophrenic, for example, to keep a diary of their day-to-day -day experiences, then that would be more qualitative data because it's word-based, it's descriptive, and the patient would be um, elaborating and explaining a lot. Okay, So it's not just a clear-cut yes or no, it's very descriptive. Okay, So those are just two different um, ways that you can think about quantitative and qualitative data. Okay, so let's have a look at a few evaluation points for qualitative and quantitative data. Um, so a strength of quantitative data is that it's easy to analyze statistically. Okay, so when large amounts of numerical data are generated, it's generally quite easy to conduct descriptive statistics or inferential tests of significance, um, which then also allows the researcher to draw comparisons and identify trends between the two different groups. Um, also, since established mathematical procedures are in place for this type of analysis, it also makes quantitative data very, very objective because there's no opinions involved in it. It's all mathematical procedures that are very, very objective. However, that being said, the limitations then kind of are the flip side of that, and that is that there is a lack of representativeness. 
Okay, so since this type of data is very often generated from closed questions, the responses that the researchers gain are very often narrow in their scope, and they're not very useful sometimes in explaining complex human behaviour. So that means that in comparison to qualitative data, numerical findings very often lack meaning and they lack context because the participants or the patients aren't allowed to give any context because that's not how the data collection works. And because of that, um, any quantitative data may not necessarily be a true representation of real life and it can therefore lack validity. Here we're equally qualitative data. Um, the strengths of that is that it is very, very rich in detail. Okay, so the investigator can gain meaningful insights into what their participants are experiencing because the participants have got the opportunity to develop their responses freely and provide the investigator with a lot of detail. Okay, so because of that, the external validity of findings that use qualitative data are enhanced because they're more likely to represent real world experiences and real world views. Um, but then, of course, it can be subjective. So because of the very rich and very often lengthy detail of participants' responses to answers, um, interpretations of this data can very often rely on the opinions and the judgments and the values of the researcher. So that means that any preconceptions that the researcher has, any values, any morals, any beliefs, any opinions, whatever, that the researcher might hold could act as a bias to any conclusions that are being drawn. Okay, so the conclusions that are being drawn are very, very related to how the researcher interprets what he has found or what she has found, and those interpretations could get influenced by the researcher's own morals and values. Okay, so that's a problem um, for qualitative data. Right, so just to finish off, let's have a quick look at what this could look like in an exam. So you've got a simple, short answer, explanation, um, what is the difference between these two types of data? Okay, so you're very often given some kind of scenario and then you're told something like here where the researcher collects quantitative data but then decides to choose qualitative data as well. What is the difference between the two? Okay, so sometimes it could be a two marker just for one difference between the two. Sometimes it can be up to a four marker for two differences between these types of data. Um, you've then also got things like this where you're given a fairly big text with a lot of information in and you just need to identify one type of data that has been collected and then explain your answer. Okay, so this again, it could be a two marker, explain uh, for one mark and identify for one mark, but there are also examples out there where you get one mark for identifying a correct type of data and then you have three marks to um, justify your answer or explain your answer. Um, and then you've also got this kind of thing where you have to relate it to a different topic. So this bottom one um, is a good example of that. So give two reasons why behaviorists don't collect qualitative data. So you need to know about the behaviorist approach and you need to know about the differences between qualitative and quantitative data. So that's just something also um, to be aware of that very often these topics can cross over a little bit. And then finally, You've got your good old evaluation questions. The trick with this one is you need to make sure you apply the evaluation point to the study that's been doing. Don't just give a generic problem that they might have. So that's one just to be aware of. And then also um, you might be asked to write a question that would be ideal for collecting a specific type of data. Okay, so I hope all that's made sense. Um, that is the end of part one. So if you now want to find out about primary and secondary data, then the link is down below in the description section. Okay, thank you very much for listening, and I hope it's been useful.